I'm Rahila Khan I'm from the University of Nottingham. I'm a trustee of the Physiological Society and I'm also chair of its Diversity and Inclusion Task Force. As we all know, the pandemic has had an impact on society and the population throughout in terms of its mental health. And this has also extended to academics. These measures taken to curtail and actually limit the spread of the pandemic has obviously affected academics who are already working in a highly pressured environment. So this session has been designed to explore some of the impact of this, and I'm going to be joined by a panel of four speakers who I'm delighted I'll be introducing shortly. And the session itself will consist of a format of around 40 minutes, during which we'll hear from the personal experiences of the academics joining me. And there will be a 20 minute question and answer session um, later on. With no further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel. And firstly, I'd like to begin with Chantelle Race. Chantelle is Marketing and Director, um, Communications Director for Frontiers. Um, suite of journals. Um, she's based in Switzerland and has been instrumental in the publication of the report on the academic response to COVID-19. Thank you, Chantelle. I'd also like to introduce Francesco Tamanini from um, the University of Reading. And Francesco is a neurophysiologist, a lecturer. And the third um, academic joining us is Christi Christiana Bircher, She's a postdoc also from the University of Reading and both Francesco and Christina contributed to the Future Physiologies Conference that was run in the summer uh, relating to mental health. Last but not least, we're joined by David Palmer, who is CEO, CEO of the charity Mind in Bexley. He's also a part-time lecturer at the University of Kent where he completed his PhD. So I'm going to introduce, uh, well, sorry, Chantelle will kick off with her report shortly, but just to say that for the Q&A sessions, you can feel free to submit questions at any time. You can submit your questions by clicking at the button on the bottom of your screen. And these questions will be addressed to the panelists. If you could kindly add your name and institute unless you wish to remain anonymous. And also, Finally, just to mention that the panel session and the whole session is actually being recorded and we'll issue you with a link via email, which will be available hopefully in early January. So keep those questions coming and I'd like to hand over to Chantelle Race to give us a summary of the findings of the Frontiers report. Thank you, Chantelle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rahila. Uh, hi everybody um, and thank you again for the introduction. I am Chantelle. I am the Chief Communications Officer at Frontiers. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Frontiers, Frontiers is one of the largest open access publishers. We have over 850 specialty sections that span the entire academic spectrum. So while I am not an academic myself, I do work very closely with the academic community on a daily basis. This includes over 600,000 authors who have published with us, as well as over 220,000 editors and reviewers who sit on one of our editorial boards. So in May and June of this year, we ran an international survey with our authors, editors and reviewers in order to capture how the pandemic has impacted researchers and their work. Topics included their perceptions of the political response, what impact they have seen on their research funding, um, their attitudes to publishing and sharing research, how they can contribute to finding solutions, and most importantly, what are the lessons learned and how can we mitigate future disasters. We believe that it is the science that is going to help us get out of this crisis so it was imperative for us to give the academic community a voice during this incredibly challenging time, especially when you were under such extraordinary pressure to provide answers. As far as we can tell, it is one of the largest academic surveys ever conducted with over 25,000 participants. They represent 152 diverse countries, roles and areas of research. 
So we were very pleased to be able to provide that platform for the scientific voice to be heard. So to set the scene for the panel discussion today, I have been asked to talk you through some of the key observations in the report. So despite the massive disruption to your lives, you as the research community have actually been incredibly resolute with the vast majority of you being able to continue working. And this actually gives us a lot of hope that the academic community will remain resilient to new ways of COVID and also that we will be better prepared uh, for future crises. While we have all been forced into our home offices, the results to told us that the majority of you are writing pub uh, papers for publication, but you do have fears and concerns. So one of the biggest concerns is around funding and that it is being redirected away from your areas of research. One may argue that uh, academics are always going to worry about funding, but there is a growing concern about the COVIDization of research funding and that it will all get funneled into COVID research at the neglect and at the expense of other key areas. So what does this mean for you, your job, your lab, your research? You had very mixed reactions over whether policymakers have listened to scientific advice. There weren't too many surprises here as it mostly reflected what we could see happening in the news. Countries where researchers felt scientific advice was listened to include New Zealand, Greece and China. However, at the bottom of the list where researchers had the highest levels of dissatisfaction and concern include the UK, Brazil, and the US. And finally, the results showed that you are pragmatically considering how to prepare for and mitigate future crises. Your biggest concern is the threat of a future pandemic. And here you stress the importance of learning from the current situation to prepare for future threats. And your other big concern is the key challenge of our time, and that is climate change. Here you drew parallels between the immediate action taken to mitigate COVID-19 and the kind of action that will be needed to tackle environmental threats. So without taking up too much more time, I'm gonna hand back over to Rahila, because um, I know that there is lots for us to discuss around lots of the challenges that have arisen for the academic community. So thanks Rahila, I'll hand back over to you. Thank you very much for that um, insight, um, Chantal. I'm sure some of that will be picked up in our discussion shortly. For now, I'm going to hand over to Francesco, Christiana and David, who in turn will address their own personal health issues that they've experienced with mental health. And I'd like to ask Francesco to begin. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you very much, Rahila, and uh, thanks, Chantelle, uh, uh, for the interesting data, which uh, I'm looking forward to comment later on. And thanks again to the FISOC uh, uh, for, you know, giving us the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, my name is Francesco Tamagnini, and uh, as uh, said, I'm a neurophysiologist here at the University uh, of Reading, and very much like pretty much most of academics uh, have always been in love with uh, science. I mean, maybe not everyone, but most of them I know, you know, since you're a child, you get this virus, so to speak, you know, this disease that brings you there. And, uh, you know, science always gave me a lot of, uh, a lot of joy. Uh, and I've always uh, enjoyed challenges very much as a matter, as a matter of fact, you know, uh, even, you know, when one day I was directing a show because, you know, in my spare time, I like to do drama. And uh, one of the actors uh, just the night before of the first exhibition uh, called me that he was in Russia. So I, I know how to deal with stress and emergency situations since a while. So I was kind of taken, a, you know, uh, by surprise when during my PhD, um, I started to uh, develop uh, signs of mental illness, specifically chronic anxiety and, uh, and depression. And, uh, uh, you know, because it was something new to me and I've no, never been shy to, uh, to a challenge. 
and then you know and then in time i've noticed that uh, you know my problem uh, was uh, present also in other people and uh, so um, i've started to contact policymakers uh, and funders uh, and and realize that there is a problem there is a problem with mental health that now covid-19 just amplifies but that has always been there and in my opinion is there because of structural problems that have to do with uh, the uh, contract system that is present in a university with the um, uh, lack of stability of jobs uh, until you know relatively late in age and so today i'm looking forward to talk about some of these topics and these issues uh, um, and you know to confront myself with uh, with other professional figures and with all of you uh, during the question and answer session thank you very much Thank you, Christina. Christiana, sorry, can we hear from you, please? Yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for joining and thanks to the Physiological Society for this amazing opportunity. Um, I moved to Reading and started my postdoc in February, right on time for the lockdown. Um, I was just getting to know people and starting to get on track with my experiments when the lab closed. And this came right after a very challenging PhD with long hours and a lot of pressure and blurry expectations and career uncertainty. So toward the end of my PhD, I came across a report in the journal Nature, which was um, a similar survey to the one we just saw among postgrads and postdocs um, about uh, mental health problems arising from their work, things such as depression and anxiety. And this report dropped on me like a bomb. Everything that was written in, written in there described my experience exactly, and it fit in perfectly with what I had been seeing around me in my colleagues. And this was a major revelation. This was the biggest revelation of my life. This is a universal problem, which isn't discussed enough. And most of us feel isolated. Um, if we struggle as PhDs, we're often told that it's supposed to be hard, that um, most academics go through this, and this is your rite of passage. This is a test you have to pass in order to become a scientist. And I saw a poster once saying that in order to be a successful academic, you have to work hard, you have to be smart, and you have to be lucky. And any two of these will suffice. Whereas the truth is you have to work well all the time and maybe you'll succeed. And many researchers are pressured to be in the lab all the time and neglect soft skills. Um, despite the fact that many universities invest a lot of money in providing soft skill training, um, and this can limit our career opportunities as well. So this year, on top of all of this, we're also faced with delayed work that puts everyone under more pressure. Um, 180 degree turns in the way um, teaching is performed and of course, loneliness and isolation. Um, and for many, career and financial uncertainty as well. Um, so I think it's important to learn and teach the distinction between being stressed and tired and suffering from poor health, because everyone recognizes that when you have the flu, you don't perform as well. And I think mental health problems are like the flu. They're a mental flu. And they make us perform poorly, which makes us waste our time and our you know, research money. So I'm here because I want to talk about what we can do as individuals. For example, we are here discussing it, which is arguably the biggest problem and the hardest step to make. So raising awareness by talking about it a lot means we can help educate postgrads and postdocs as well as, as, well as uh, more senior researchers that this is a thing, that it's a phenomenon, and that it's not isolated. And we're not alone in this, and this isn't a prerequisite for a successful career. Thanks. Thank you very much for that, Christiana. David, over to you. Good afternoon. Evening all. Um, yes, I, I sort of share some of the experience echoed by Francesco and Christina. Um, I certainly have had a um, bucket full of mental health problems over the years, um, some very severe and enduring, some not so. Um, but before I talk about them, I think it's important to pick up what I um, picked up from Chantelle's excellent presentation is that um, most of us are very resilient um, and we do find coping mechanisms. So anyone who's undertaken a PhD, um, which I'm sure many of us, um, will know how 
lonely it is um, and how a, a challenging period it can try to juggle between academia and, 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 and long hours and maybe some of us have families or, or, or paid work or teaching um, opportunities come up. So um, we normally find a way through them. Um, however, um, although we are resilient, it's, uh, it's not unnatural to feel stressed in an unnatural world. So what we've faced since March or in some countries since the beginning of the year in January is a very abnormal situation. And to um, have um, increased anxiety, worries about research funding, um, you know, it, it increased periods of, of isolation <clears throat> and, and loneliness and separation from our, our colleagues um, in, the, in the lovely canteens um, and academic corridors of institutions has probably heightened this anxiety and, and isolation. Um, so I think it's not unnatural to feel worried or to feel stressed or, um, you know, because of social media, the impact on, uh, you know, very negative, of course, at the moment, and particularly with a potential second strain of the virus, we can become completely absorbed in this and then um, lose ourselves in negativity. So um, in terms of my own mental health, I've struggled for long periods with the, with the virus, particularly in the beginning, I was absorbing all the media and, and watching the news and, you know, social media. And I ended up sort of becoming unwell. I couldn't sleep. Um, I, 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 I was over catastrophizing. I was over personalizing things. Um, I struggle in, you know, periods of stress of being able to breathe properly. Um, and it, it took me a long time to unwind and I felt that I wasn't having any space for me either. Um, I was going from from Zoom to Zoom to Zoom and eventually I was Zoomed out and I realized that I'd be sitting down, Zoomed out for, you know, eight, nine hours, whatever, without any break. So um, it became clear to me during the summer months um, that I needed to change this and I put in boundaries and, 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 and different things, which I can talk about later. But um, I think the most important thing for me is that, um, which has been echoed here by uh, Francesco and Christina, is that if you have a problem or you're feeling um, anxious or stressed, you know, talk to someone about it, share the experience, and you'll be surprised as how many people have the same experiences as you have. So I'm very happy to, you know, take part in the debate and try and answer some questions. And um, I'm looking forward to, to the rest of the workshop. Thank you to all of you for sharing um, with such searing honesty the experiences that you've gone through. But I'd like to ask you if um, you can come up with why you think particularly COVID has you know, shone a light on these, on these particular issues and what new challenges do you think it's, it's raised? And perhaps I can ask um, Francesco first. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, to, to be honest, uh, um, I, it's been years uh, since people have realized that, that uh, the economical uh, system uh, in, in academia is radically different from any other job market. Uh, you do have, uh, I call it, uh, you know, small head, uh, big butt kind of system, right? Where you've got this very small, stable head of PIs and then this undifferentiated world of short-term contracts, whether it's PhDs or postdocs or research assistants and whatnot, and that can last for um, four years. This is a very unstable uh, system uh, and it generates a lot of uh, stress, of course, uh, for, 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 many, for many years uh, because of its intrinsic instability. Then you've got an, an, an event that is catastrophic, uh, such as uh, COVID-19, and that gets all amplified. Of course, I mean, I think now, now I'm in a privileged position, now I'm a lecturer, you know, but, 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 but I, I, I think with worry about all those uh, PhD students and postdocs, uh, you know, which, which have to stop experiments uh, unless they were working on COVID-19 for six months, maybe a year and thinking constantly how this is gonna impact my life. Am I gonna fail now? Am I not gonna make it to the PI level, you know? 
and that doesn't help that 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 is one of those systems uh, you know one of those back thoughts uh, that 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 constantly keep you awake that don't don't allow you to focus properly on your science that don't allow you to join to, to enjoy <laughs> you know your science i mean science can be frustrating no one no one would would stop that is part of the job but you should you should fundamentally enjoy it you know and uh, and so and so i think to be honest that COVID-19, in a way, you know, opened the Pandora's box, uh, opened the Pandora's vase, and 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 amplified a problem, a structural problem that was uh, uh, that was already there, a problem that doesn't affect only mental health, but also, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong, but it affects also a problem uh, of equality. I mean, uh, you, Rahila, you know, you're, you're, you're an officer for equality and diversity, you know, and and academia preaches a lot about equality and diversity. But on a job system, I've rarely seen a more unfair place than academia, because when you have uh, sh such short term contracts for so long, then, you know, it's a matter of privilege being able to afford that level of uh, instability for years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a privilege that may come from family, from race, from gender, you, you, you name it, but it doesn't promote equality. You know, if you want to promote equality, if you want to promote, uh, uh, you know, balance, uh, work-life balance, you need to give uh, some sort of uh, job stability, in my opinion, before the age of 40 or the age of uh, 35. Yeah. Otherwise, people is either going to continue and, you know, grind or, you know, somehow feel sick or, you know, somehow cope with it or change. Thank you. I wonder if the other panelists have any other comments to make on some of the new challenges that COVID-19 has introduced that maybe have been become have become exacerbated. Um, and if there are any that you would like to talk about now. Um, I have a couple. Um, so one of the challenges we already faced was work pressure, lots of you know, large amounts of work to be done very quickly. And for many researchers, this has been exacerbated by the two lockdowns, or at least the first lockdown, because many of us feel that we need to make up for the time loss. So we have to put everything into overdrive and start working as much as possible. Um, and for a lot of postdocs um, and a lot of PhDs, I assume, um, it's the career, career uncertainty. Um, I'm quite lucky because I started my postdoc right before the first lockdown. But um, a lot of postdocs were toward the end of the contract. Um, they're aware that there isn't as much funding now as it was before. Uh, there will be fewer postdoctoral positions. Um, so I think these two factors combined are probably going to exacerbate the, um, the anxiety that everybody's been feeling. Thank you. Um, and yes, I, I second that really. I think um you know the structure of research funding you know which Chantel alluded to um i think that's obviously a concern so my particular expertise is around social sciences and migration um you know uh, it, it could well be seen as the bottom of the pile in terms of research funding um, and grants um allocation um i think the issue of teaching cannot be underestimated um you know, there's already significant pressures, um, you know, of, of teach, teaching in academic settings uh, with significant more pressures imposed pre-lockdown. So you add, you know, the pressures of doing this remotely, um, the, the whole um, stress uh, for students and then the impact of the student uh, sort of lecturer relationship, um, where I imagine that there is certainly demands imposed on on lecturers where perhaps um, the support mechanism isn't in place. Um, I certainly know when I've lectured, um, you know, support is, is alien really. So you add that into a lockdown isolated sort of environment in your home, then you're, you could be potentially dealing with a lot of student pressures that perhaps you haven't got the resources to, to support you with. I think the issue around contracts raised by Francesco is very important. A lot of academic contracts are very short term, so that's going to increase anxiety about, you know, future, <coughs> future, um, future contracts for individuals. Um, 
And I think, I just think the whole, um, even the issue which I've been dealing with recently in my own work is about the, the return. That's also going to be, uh, create some anxieties for, for people. Will we return to a normal setting? What will that look like? What happens if you have a long-term health condition yourself? Um, are you, you're, you're living in an environment where people are a potential risk? Um, you know, these are all real factors. Are academic sectors able to have that open relationship with staff so that they can you know they, they, they can they can discuss these these issues these real issues in an open environment without feeling discriminated so um i, th I think there's loads of different issues of covid um and and how it's impacted anxiety but certainly the main ones from what i've been seeing is classic around research and i've applied for some research grants myself and i've been unsuccessful um, and, and that obviously impacts on, on morale and, and well-being anyway and self-esteem and the issues of, of working in isolation with students. Thanks. Some of the feedback that uh, we have received, uh, Rahila, has been around being isolated and uh, that that has really exas uh, exacerbated mental health and, and, and anxiety as well. I think um, we are all naturally gregarious people and now suddenly you are all alone. Um, it, it, the feedback we've been getting is that has created an enormous amount of stress. Um, we, for example, have had doctors who've been calling in, they are working the night shift at a hospital in Italy. Um, and that isolation is, there's, there's two sides to it. They're having to watch people you know, succumb to the virus and lose their lives all alone. And they are not able to spend those last moments with their loved ones. So the type of impact that then, that then has on the doctors and nurses. So isolation is, is, is something that we've heard a lot about. And um, we are definitely looking to see if there are other ways that we can connect. Uh, we're not all gonna, you know, rush out into the streets uh, come January. So we do have to think of other ways that we can connect with people. Um, and just provide that type of support that people need in, in a time like this. I just wanted to um, add something which I, I hadn't mentioned, which is actually a real challenge, and it's a real challenge for me, but many of my colleagues, is trying to do work when children are off school for long periods of time. So having that work balance, you know, between families, it's a real stress, um, and, 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 you know, trying to do home education, and keep children, you know, uh, amused and of course safe, um, and trying to deal, uh, you know, with, with, with teaching and, 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 and working and research. And sometimes there isn't flexibility around these things, you know. So if your lecture is at two o'clock, your lecture is at two o'clock, and you can't say, well, can I postpone that or whatever. So, um, you know, the, the balance between working from home and trying to, to balance family life is also a major, major challenge. And it's certainly one of my biggest stressors actually during the pandemic. So I just thought I'd bring that into the, into the mix as well. Yes, thank you. That's come up before. Francesco, over to you. I think you have a comment. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to, to, to comment on uh, um, Chantelle's remarks, uh, uh, you know, on, um, on, on people having experience in, in, in clinical settings and on David's remarks on uh, the, 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 you know, the need of, to homeschool kids and so on and so forth, you know. It reminds me, you know, I can only echo that and it reminds us all, you know, that this is a catastrophic event that, you know, affected, I think, everyone in, 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 different, uh, in different capacities and, and, and in different jobs, you know, from, uh, I don't know, the shop uh, to the academic uh, to the... So, you know, what, what I think is very, very important to underlie here, uh, and these, you know, just a chance you know that, that 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 we get to promote these discourse even even more you know is that when you have a fragile system as the academic system is for uh, you know anyone that is not a pi basically in terms of jobs anxiety and depression i know it sounds weird you know but <laughs> it's not really the problem anxiety and depression is is an alarm bell you know, it's something that once it arrives, it's already too late. It's telling you that there is a problem in the foundations, you know. 
So, you know, I think we should also be careful. Of course, having coping strategies is great. Resilience is great. And, you know, <laughs> Chantel's data showed it, <laughs> you know, like academics tend to be resilient, maybe sometimes even too resilient <laughs> for their own good, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, yeah, no, coping mechanisms are great. But if there is an endemic problem uh, for these uh, reactive, at the end of the day, uh, mental disorders, you know, it's because there's a cause and the cause is the instability of the structure that hosts them. So you're always in a fight or flight mode. And we, we, we're not fit, our brain is not fit for that. We're not rodents, you know, we're, we're, we're apes. We're programmed to sit and eat, uh, you know, like vegetables and things like gorillas. And then every once in a while get stressed and fight or flight, you know. When we, when we are constantly edging, that destroys us. And that's what happens in academia. That's what happened to me for 10 years. That is what happening for, for, for all those PhDs that enter all full of life and they get out of there broken. What are we? Are, did we all beca become wimps? You know, like weaklings uh, suddenly, like all of us, yeah. <laughs> or the vast majority, or there's, a, or there's a, you know, deeper structural problem that now COVID is showing, in, a, in, in even even in a more dramatic way. I think that this is the case, and we need we need we need to promote a more serious discourse with policymakers, with funding bodies, to finally address what are the structural problems, and mostly that is economical instability. Yes, and thank you. And the PGR community has been very hard hit by COVID. But I just wanted to ask you um, all, um, what do you think organisations and our institutes could be doing more of to help us deal with these difficult situations? David? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, I think the first thing um, with any institution or organisation is to promote an open culture. Um, so that there is a, a mechanism for people to be able to express how they're feeling and to be open, you know, about their struggles. Um, because by doing that, then we can, you know, we, as in, I'm talking about the academic the institution, um, you can put in, in support in place and, and offer some potential solutions. And it could even be, you know, just take a couple of weeks off or, or you know, um, you know, whatever, depends on, on, on how, how, how it is. Um, I think also, you know, again, having mental health tools um, in place. So in the work I do at MIND and the University of Kent in, in Canterbury, you know, we're looking at mentoring and developing mentoring schemes so that um, there can be a mentoring relationship between academics and students outside of the academic setting. And we use green spaces for that. So we've got a, a, an allotment that we, we meet in and um, that can help to, to break down some of those barriers as well, of course, between the academic and the student, but can also be a, um, a really good social space for, for people that can have benefits for both parties. So it's almost like a mentor-mentee relationship. Um, one of the big things is, I think, is to increase transparency in the workplace too, um, so that, you know, um, staff are open about challenges. Um, you know, so that there's regular updates about developments, about like we talked about contracts, um, about contract renewals, about student numbers and intakes for the academic year, you know, about, about cuts. I think if it's more open and transparent, people are better able to deal with it, um, rather be surrounded by a sort of a culture of secrecy. Um, and I think having, you know, um, the, 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 developing a, a positive work-life balance um, and I know we all struggle with that, um, and it's becoming increasingly hard to have that now. Um, but I think if it's within the culture that, you know, there is that positive work-life balance, then I think um, individuals will not feel so guilty um, if they're not working till, you know, 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock in the morning, whatever it is. So I think it's around changing a culture and, and, and um, trying to develop a um, an openness for people to be able to talk and share these and 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 work with 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 community groups you know local community organizations i don't think academics and academic institutions should have all the answers but there's loads of of local community 
um, agencies um, in nearby sort of facilities. And they, I think it's opening a partnership with them. And that's what we've done at the University of Kent. So mine worked there. And it's been a very, really interesting partnership and it's going to develop further. So I think it's just having that, um, you know, being prepared to, to, to look at issues and to be able to, to change a culture, which is not easy. It's not easy, but I think that's the starting point. Yes, I think you're right with research culture. There seems to be a lot going on in that space to try and open up a bit more and, and change the culture. I wonder if Francesco and Christiana had anything to add about what maybe institutions could do more for us? I think um, socializing goes a long way, even if we can't really socialize. But like um, a coffee break in a socially distant manner or um, even on, on Zoom or something like that would go a long way. Uh, one of the main problems I faced myself and I've uh, found many other people to face is um, just labs being empty. Sometimes we come into work, we do our experiments and there are maybe one or two other people in the lab. So, um, so I think yeah, loneliness is one of the biggest problems. So I think encouraging people to have some coffee or some tea together every once in a while at a distance would, would help a lot. And I think um, at least for PhD students, it would help a lot if we had clear expectations of what needs to happen over the next few months. Because as I said, a lot of PhD students feel they've missed out on three months of experiments and they want to rush and finish everything on time. So I think um, slowing down and sitting down and having a, a list of clear expectations would help a lot of people. Thank you. Francesca? I've, I've, got, I've got one slide that I very quickly put together by doing a search on Google. Can I share my screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay, I will do that. So, so I apologize in advance for the quality, yeah? Okay, so there's Phoebe and Joy. This is what I think uh, the institutions should do to help uh, people to have a better work-life balance. Reduce, and the institution says reduce. Employee, and the institution says employee. Workloads and the institution says workloads. And then the employee says, reduce, employ, workloads. And the institution replies, mental health webinar, <laughs> which is just a little bit of self-irony here, you know, about how, what we really need. We need to reduce the employ workloads, in my opinion. And it's not just about, uh, you know, reducing the quantity of it is not just about the quantity. We can take a lot, you know, as I said, we're very, very resilient, but it's about rationalizing it. It's about uh, giving clear and achievable objectives. And uh, once those are given, then you have to meet them. And if that means that one day you have to work 12 hours, that's not a problem. We're not kids. We can take our medicine, you know. But if there's no an objective, especially in science, you know, in research science, where there's no end to what you could do, and you put together, you know, all the stressors coming from the instability, all the stressors coming from social isolation, from the lack of communication, from log meetings, and then, you know, you don't have clear objectives, and you don't know how much you're supposed to work to meet those objectives and whatever you do you don't know if it's enough or not that once again contributes to the overall instability and to the overall constant alertness that then leads people to get sick in my opinion so reduce and optimize i mean the other thing that um i didn't mention um and again linked to what's been said earlier is that there does need to be more resources into counselling support services. And um, this is nothing to do just with academia. This is a national issue across all workplaces. But, um, you know, it's very clear, um, you know, that the, the, the needs are very high, um, which has been heightened by the academic, uh, by the, the pandemic. And I think, um, um, you know, the, there was talk uh, in, in Parliament the other day about academia and mental health and student mental health. So I think it's clear, um, certainly from the work we've done in Kent, is that there needs to be more 
um, facilities for people to be able to get help and to be able to get help quickly so that it doesn't turn into um, an acute stage later on. And I think that that is across the board in our settings, including academia. Thank you. Well, keep your questions coming in. We do have some questions for the panel. Um, and I'm just going to take some questions now. Uh, we have around 15 minutes left for this session, so please post your questions. And I'm going to um, uh, ask this question first. Um, it's a, about counselling services at universities are full. What can these institutions provide in the way of helping develop mechanisms to increase resilience? And should group sessions or peer sessions be encouraged? Anyone can take that, but it touches already, I think, on what David has already stated. I mean, I'm a, I'm a firm believer um, in peer support, by the way, um, as I mentioned around mentoring, but having group peer support um, is also, um, you know, in terms of financial constraints, it can be um, beneficial where you can sort of work with six, eight, ten people together um and not be hugely costly and the other thing of course is i think academic academia need to look outside of the academic setting and to work with partner agencies to provide um you know counseling support and bring them on site um obviously virtually at the moment but um absolutely to support the whole idea of, of peer support i think it's so beneficial and you know because we're all um, have experience of mental health at some stage in our lives, you know, by sharing that alone, just in, a, in a, an informal setting, you know, whether it's over Zoom or whether it, it's going for a walk, can be hugely beneficial. And often most people have that, that's just what they need, just someone to talk to, to offload some of their issues. Anybody else? Otherwise, I was just wondering if um, the second part or the first part of that question is to develop mechanisms to increase resilience. But we've already said that scientists and the academic community is quite resilient anyway. So does anybody else have any suggestions on how that might be tweaked slightly more? Yeah, so if possible, I would like to comment on on that, you know, like, I mean, in, increase resilience. I, I mean, I don't know exactly, you know, the the history of, of the person, but I think it's not about increasing resilience, you know, I think people is, is intrinsically resilient. And if we're talking about increasing resilience for reaching excellence, then yeah, I mean, yes, there should be courses uh, for being successful, right? There is a part of people, it can't be everyone who's, who excels, right? There must be a small part of people that need to be e extremely resilient, extremely smart, extremely ingenuous to succeed. And so that's fine. But if all this extreme resilience, ingenuity, and, and, and intelligence is required not to succeed, not to excel, but to survive, that's when we start to have a problem. And so I think we should be courageous enough to say, no, I, I shouldn't be required to be extra resilient just to, to float above, you know, that's how I felt for years, you know, when I was a PhD and a, and a postdoc, I never considered myself a stupid or a lazy person, you know, but I, I was feeling that all that effort wasn't there to, to actually succeed, you know, to be like the extra good one, but just to survive, that's wrong, that, that, that makes you sick, you know, mm. so I, I, I wanted to give that contribution to that, to the point of the, of the thing. Yeah, building on that, I also think peer support and group discussions are, are terrific because, as I said in the beginning, one of the most important things is to start a discussion <clears throat> about this topic. Um, I know some universities, uh, including ours, have volunteer um, mental health um, aiders. People have had some training in how to just listen or how to direct someone to perhaps more help or some resources. Um, so I know counseling is a problem in academia and outside of academia, you know, the, the lack of um, available counselors. But um, in the absence of that, I think volunteer mental health aiders are, are really good. Thanks. And Chantel, from your survey, what came out um, about this 
kind of peer support resilience? Did you have anything specific that you can um, relate to in the survey on this topic? We didn't actually ask anything about um, peer support. Um, we'll do it next year. We're going to plan on doing uh, another one next year. We did ask about the support that uh, researchers felt that they were receiving from their institutions. Um, it was, of course, in May and June, so this was a while ago. Um, and an overwhelming number, I think around 71 or 72 percent, said that they do feel that they were adequately supported um, by the institutions during this. Um, but maybe one thing about uh, this sort of peer support um, from the experience that we've had is every single time we've tried to set up something or, or bring some people to bit together, there's just been this overwhelming positivity to come together, to help each other. It's been really touching uh, that even during such a horrendous pandemic crisis that is happening in the world, um, people do have this inner resilience and they are prepared to step up and, and, and help their peers. And it's, it's been an incredibly warming uh, experience to see all of that. Um, you know, we, we're a publisher, we are, we are trying to get all of this uh, research published really quickly because it's, you know, it's pertinent, it's happening, we need the answers now. So we, we sent a call for participation, you know, who would like to step up and help with what we call in that fast peer review so we can get this, get this out quickly. And, you know, we were overwhelmed with the response. Everybody wanted to, to step up and, and help. So, you know, maybe that's something to take away as well, that they are always gonna be people around you who, who are gonna be able to support you and, and are happy to do it. Yes. I mean, I think that's one of the messages that's come out of COVID, doesn't it? The, the be kind uh, slogan is that, you know, uh, giving something to others, i.e., you know, uh, stepping up to do some some peer reviews, um, you know, and, and, and trying to increase the, the, the publication um, wheel. Um, you know, being kind is, is, is going to impact on your own mental well-being. It's going to make you feel good, you know. So that's definitely one of the things I've seen um you know that's come out of covid which is and you know and the idea of a community and perhaps that's the going back to what francesca talked about isolation you know community and academia doesn't always go hand in hand you know so maybe this is an opportunity to break some down some of those barriers yes good point so we have a question from sam flack is asking do you think the culture of working late and having a poor work-life balance in academia stems from the normalized culture of university students staying up until morning hours to study. So kind of a continuum really that these habits are formed very early on. I think these two things feed into each other. Uh, they're sort of, um, yeah, they sort of um, augment each other. So uh, I don't think one causes the other, I think they just go hand in hand. Um, Okay. Yeah, so, yeah no, just to add up on that, right? It really depends on the reason why you stay up late, right? Because if you stay up late because you're having drinks with your mates and you're having fun and you're enjoying your life, as I was doing when I was a student and I loved every single nanosecond of it and I've got absolutely no regrets about that. I don't think that's much of a problem because you choose to do that and then you take responsibility of it. To me, the problem started, and maybe there is a relationship, you know, because we learn uh, uh, subconsciously cir circadian rhythms, you know, in a way, but you can also adjust those. Now, the problem is when you feel compelled to do that. The problem when you feel like this mysterious, I call it the black hand, you know, like a mysterious hand, you know, over your head that forces you to stay there, you know. Don't, don't, don't know exactly why well because you don't have a you know precise objective so whatever you do is never enough <laughs> you know so, so, ah, just one experiment more just one gel more just one cell more you know mm -hmm. and then you stay there late you know it's never enough and then over time that that grinds on you and it ruins ruins you you know yeah being um, overworked and always tired has been glorified to the point that this is how you measure your value or your worth. How tired yeah. are you equals yeah. 
how good you are doing. Yeah, I mean, oh, no, absolutely. I don't think there's a problem with staying up late. It depends on no. it depends on how early you get up in the following morning. And, exactly. And like, as you said, uh, Francesco, if you're doing this, you know, day in, day out, night in, night out, it's yeah. obvious going to take an impact on your well-being yeah. and your productivity and part of the issue is that we're all having to do more for less I, I, I absolutely hate that term but it's true it's that you know if you're teaching all day and you want to get in a research grant the only probably time you're going to have to do it is in the evening and that has become part of the culture and that's what I was saying about you know institutions trying to promote a life work balance and it's yeah. so important for long-term well-being so maybe this is a weird one, right? But I found very inspiring this sentence that was said uh, by a drill surgeon in a war movie to a sniper. And what, what and that's what I also tell my students in the lab, you know, which are always in a rush to do a lot of experiments, you know, I was teaching the sniper how to shoot, you know, I was saying you have to go slow. You have to move slow because slow is smooth. Smooth is accurate. Accurate is fast. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like this thing of that the more you do, the faster you do, the better it is, is a delusion. You're just going to become more inaccurate. You're going to become more tired. You're going to do more mistakes. And that's going to build up into this. Uh, what my cousin was telling me, my cousin is a psychologist. She gave me this nice uh, uh, thing. It's called recessive spiral, you know, <laughs> where, where, where basically, you know, what you do creates more stress and then you overcompensate and you try to do more, you know, and then, you know, you go into this whirlpool that drags you down. That's where I went and that's where many people I knew, you know, went, went, went down, you know. So we need to actually make an effort also probably as individuals to, to probably pace ourselves, not to take care of our feelings, also that, you know, but also in the interest of our work, mm -hmm. cool down, take it easy, do one experiment less. You're not going to cure COVID-19 overnight. It's going to take you time. And, and and that's probably the culture that we should bring in more and yeah, it starts realize, from us as well sorry uh, we need to realize that beyond a certain point you're just creating the illusion of productivity you're not necessarily productive anymore yeah. the fact that you're there all the time doesn't mean that your results are going to be better quality in fact it's very likely that they'll be worse yeah so in relation to that we have two comments um and i'd like to just read them out but one of them is um an anonymous one, but someone saying, I'm not the only teaching lecturer who has felt utterly overwhelmed by moving to the demands of online delivery of a discipline like physiology. It's been truly challenging for staff and students alike. And they're also saying they've lost two teaching physiologists to voluntary severance. And I think for those of us who are working in academia, we, we feel that we're trying to look after ourselves, but we also have our students, our post-docs, um, PhD students to, to look out for as well. And I think the second comment relates to what Christiana's really echoed nicely, which is the metrification of achievement. So everyone knows what numbers they need, income, publications to advance. Unfortunately, unfortunately there are no numbers for altruism and kindness, yeah. collaboration, et cetera. And I think, again, that speaks to this, that we're on kind of a treadmill, it seems, where no one's really looking out for uh, mental health of academics in this, currently in this environment. So thanks for those comments. I just wanted to go back to Chantel about the survey again, because again, it picks up on something that David's also mentioned about family and demands for caring for young children, or you know, if you're a carer for somebody. But I noticed that in the survey, um, you, I don't think you picked out whether gender, whether women were being more affected by COVID being the main carers and that's certainly a theme that's come out in some of the discussions we've had in various other spaces so I wondered if you could comment or um, on that and whether as you said previously is that if you're going to do another survey if you hope to break down some of these um, into you know more kind of gender specific data. So we do have gender data um, all of the raw data we are making available. So if anybody wants access to that raw data, you can find it on the report um, and you can feel free to slice and dice it in whichever way you like. We did have a look at um, whether 
there were different reactions from from men or women we had heard the same that women were you know more stressed uh, with additional responsibilities at home as well as trying to um you know continue with their research uh, the the statistics that we saw actually didn't show much difference at all um, we had uh, a 50 50 split between men and women who were taking the survey and at every single question we looked to see whether there were you know vast differences between uh, between those uh, two groups and in, in and in their responses uh, and we didn't see anything um, so who knows what that means um, but uh, yes we will continue to to see if, if that changes over time and and where we're at next year Okay, so we're um, approaching six o'clock, but I have a couple of other questions. And one that we, I don't think I'm in a position to answer at all is how many academics have been made unemployed at your work as a result of COVID-19? So we've had one answer previously from the chat, yeah. but do you know of any um, have you been made unemployed? Well, I, 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 can, I can speak for my group, uh, you know, I mean, more, more than um, having people being kicked out uh, is, people not having their contract renewed because all the new grants have been put on hold, you know? Okay. And I'm talking about gold. I'm talking about people that any company around the world would be lucky to have, even for doing something different from two photon imaging or slice electrophysiology as we do in my lab, you know, people with incredible intelligence, incredible resilience, incredible transferable skills, you know. I, I honestly don't know where the economical model of academia comes from. I can't get my head around it. I, 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 don't, I don't get how they can be on the market by letting people with this talent going away after you spent maybe a couple of years training them and making them really really good you know and you've spent money <laughs> and time into that and then you give them to someone else or you leave them at home unemployed because of COVID-19 not being able to get their grant renewed because all the grant review board have been postponed of one year that's a huge waste of money. That's a huge, we, since we talk about, uh, you know, uh, metrics, you know, other than, you know, being a huge waste of human feelings, if, if, if we want to go that way, you know, um, I, I don't like it. <laughs> I think, I don't think it's just unfair. I think it's plainly stupid. You know what I mean? Um, and that, that, that has to change. Yeah, so the final question that's coming that we've got time briefly to address is, should academics and PIs have to put delays on emails sent in the evenings or work weekends so that researchers don't feel compelled or feel inadequate if they don't answer um, until work hours? Now, I know that that's been trialed in some areas, definitely, as a way of limiting, so you're not having to respond to emails. But I was wondering, especially what David thinks, um, in terms of, because obviously I was wanting practical solutions to some of this as well, so that people listening in can feel almost empowered, uh, you know, to, to not have to respond to all of the, the pressures that they're exposed to in the academic environment. So I was just wondering if you had any comments really, David? I mean, I think it goes back to the, the working culture that I, I talked about. Um, and I think, you know, there should be, um, flexibility within that to, 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 to do with those with the caring needs. But in terms of working outside of normal hours, um, I think, yeah, we, we, we should be able to say uh, we need to have that work-life balance and we should be able to say, no, um, we're not responding at nine o'clock on a Friday night. We will deal with it on Monday. Um, and, 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 you know, and not feel guilty about it, of course. And that's where I think the institution comes in so that that culture is, in, is encouraged. Um, but it's very hard to do. I'm, I'm guilty of it as like anybody else. Um, but I think to, 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 to um, you know, for, for our own well-being um, and, and our own well-being of our colleagues, I think if it is introduced, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, healthy, it's a healthy thing, yeah, absolutely. I think introducing it would uh, sort of pave the way towards normalizing the work-life balance. 
yeah, that, that's what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, these little bricks of these little demonic bricks that completely destroyed our lives for some reason, you know, uh, don't help. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm sure one day, you know, there will be a show like Mad Men, you know, where instead of lighting up a cigarette uh, into an office as they did it in the 60s, and when we look at it, it looks weird, you know, because they smoke everywhere. They're going to make fun of us, you know, checking emails all the time, you know, because it's like similar pulling out a cigarette, uh, you know, in a room where there is a baby, you know, and, and exposing them. And one day I'm sure they're going to make a show, you know, where I'm sure they're going to make a show where they're going to make fun of us using the these things at all the time. So absolutely, yes, fundamental generating a culture that discourages the checking of emails all the time as some sort of a fetish, you know, to control your life that you feel is going out of control. Um, but And that should start from above because it's from above that you give the good example and between peers as well. Thank you. That's been excellent. There you've all raised some really interesting um, ideas and proposals and practical solutions is you know things like the green spaces peer support that we can really begin to start making uh, more of so i'd like to close this session by thanking all of you for your insight i'd like to thank the audience for listening in and for the questions and just to rem a reminder that the covid19 conference lessons learned from the front line continues tomorrow beginning at two o'clock for the final day Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you've enjoyed this session and be on behalf of the Physiological Society, thanks to all of you. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you very much. Bye. Bye. I can't leave. <laughs> Are we still on? Are we still online? No, I think Rosie was going to take. It'd be good to get it. feedback just to see whether that was what was expected. But I thought that's might what happened. But yeah, yeah. Okay, Thank you, David. I forgot to mention that about feedback. That that was something that I yeah. did have on my notes, but I just forgot to mention yeah. it. But yeah, uh, I think it's it really right. well shared, by the way. So oh, that's my feedback to you. So really that's my, yeah, yeah, very well <laughs> shared. Thank you very much, Raila. Thank you very much. That's That's very, good. Good. very boundary. Take care. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. Thank bye you, bye. David. Thank you very much. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.